You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another fun and friendly episode of Ask Drone You News Edition. This week, that's right, I will have a little bit more energy because I'm not trying to do 100 squats every morning and lose weight. But bringing us into today's news that's more relevant and more important, joining me today to go over all this fun stuff with you is the Flying Dutchman. Hiya, how are you? Hey, good morning. No squats for me, man. Let's go today with the show. Hey, no squats, but I know you're up and walking, which has a lot of people excited, myself included. That said, let's move into our first piece of drone news this week. Well, it looks like the marketing nomenclature and vernacular has changed when it comes to discussing which drones are made in America and which aren't even down to the specificity of the parts that are made in drones. And all of this may be foreshadowing what a lot of us are expecting to see come December. So with that said, Haya, Autel, man, they're digging down. They are, they are fully transparent. And frankly, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, they are transparent. We know Autel Robotics is a, uh, a Chinese-owned company. They have operations here in the United States, and they now launch their marketing campaign to promote the uh, Evo 2 Jewel, which is really geared towards government use and first responders and emergency crews and the like. And they say that these drones are now made in the USA. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the exact uh, requirements are to be able to use that label made in the USA. They do have a little disclaimer in their marketing uh, information saying that these drones are made with foreign and domestic parts and labor. So they're being assembled here in the United States, but they still contain parts that might have been made in some other country, let's say China. Now, it's kind of interesting because, of course, uh, we know that Skydio, they make their drones, they produce their drones here in the United States, but those drones still contain Chinese-made parts. We know that Parrot recently uh, moved or partnered with a company uh, right out of Boston here in the Northeast to start producing their drones so that they can work with the United States government. We know, of course, that DJI started making their government edition drones, I think about a year ago in California. So all these drone companies are trying to to do something to make them more America made, if you will. And neither one of them, I think at this point at least, is officially truly made in the United States with only American labor and only American parts. Probably is feasible, but I don't know if it's economically feasible at this point. Uh, It's going to be interesting to see where this is going to head longer term, let's say a year, two years from now. Are we actually going to see drones that are fully produced in the United States? It's something I would like to see happen for sure. But at the same time, I would like to see anything happen that brings more competition to the drone industry. It's too lopsided still in my mind. Um, But yeah, Autel Robotics now pushing their Autel Evo 2 dual drone, the one with the uh, thermal and a regular camera, as made in the USA. Awesome. Well, speaking about competition being good for the market, couldn't agree more with you, Haya. And that brings us to our next piece of news. In fact, one of my favorite, all-time favorite drone manufacturers and a recent all-time favorite, and Adam, I'm sorry for not returning the demo unit back uh, last week. It's completely my fault. But FreeFly is probably one of my favorite drones to fly higher. And I'm not saying that they're not paying us to be on the show. They're not sponsoring us. But yesterday, when I saw the release of this new drone from FreeFly, it seems like the Honda Civic of drones might actually come to fruition. And I say that, Haya, because FreeFly has done something with the PX4 flight controller that no other American manufacturer really has done. And what they have done is essentially change the feel of the control of the aircraft to feel like what you're used to with DJI, to have these natural kind of swooshing motions and changing the PIDs and everything to make the bird feel more stable and adding you know, a lot of weight and a heavy CG and the right CG just 
they take engineering to a new level, Haya, which is why I'm so excited for this new drone release that's coming down the pipe. Haya, what do you have from FreeFly? Yeah, FreeFly Systems, a US-based company, they released some sneak peek videos yesterday on Twitter and also on Instagram. And it shows what is soon to be released, a new FreeFly Astro drone. Back up for a second here. Uh, We know FreeFly Systems, of course, for their high-end drones at the Alta 6, the Alta 8. Those are expensive drones. They are designed to carry heavy payloads, professional cameras, the kind of stuff that you would uh, expect to see on film sets and the like. Now, recently, which I think by now is probably about a year ago they launched the alta x which is the drone that uh, you have one uh, version of which is a foldable drone still a high-end drone all carbon fiber still quite expensive Uh, maybe you can give some more information about that in a second and now freefly is launching uh, yet a less expensive drone at least we hope it will be less expensive the astro now the benefit of the astro of course is that you can mount different cameras on it i mean in this short video they promote the sony a7r4 but i would suspect that you could probably also uh, mount for instance the new sony a7s3 on it and maybe some other cameras as well i still don't think that this drone is going to be really affordable i would guess that it's probably going to be around ten thousand bucks and then we still don't know if that includes the controller or the gimbal you still need to get a camera you would need to have a nice lens as well so it's still going to be an expensive pack when it comes down to it. However, it's a truly uh, American-based company. They design and manufacture the drones here in the United States. And in their short sneak peek video, they kind of offered you a list of uh, features, basically, that this drone is going to offer you. And it's including things like small, light, quiet, fast, folding, great flight times, the ability to carry some pretty serious camera gear, weather sealed, uh, and the list goes on and on. And I think it's going to be pretty much a kick-ass drone, although it probably won't be really affordable or cheap in any way. Then again, if you have the need for these kind of drones with more professional equipment, you're probably doing drone jobs that are worth the money anyway. And in that sense, this drone might not be expensive when you look at it in that light. Super exciting. Um, We don't know the exact price at this point. We don't know exactly when it's going to be released. I think it's going to probably come out pretty soon, I would hope. And if they can start shipping right away as well, that would be, uh, yeah, would be amazing. Yeah, that really would be amazing. Um, What is exciting here is the fact that FreeFly has integrated some things I haven't seen FreeFly ever do before. Things like smart batteries, things like yeah. third-party SDK, which is the MAV SDK. If you're familiar with QGIS and whatnot, then this drone is going to literally work right inside of your wheelhouse already. I agree with you, Haya. Price is definitely a concern. Um, you know, FreeFly is known to, um, uh, to produce quality machinery, highly engineered, uh, and the price points, you know, reflect that. Uh, that being said, I do think that this is really exciting, Haya. I love the way free fly drones fly. It's just an experience like uh, back in the beginning of the days when you really had control of drones. And for some people, that's not exciting. But here's the thing. They make some of the most stable drones with the heaviest, you know, payload capacities. This drone is not that. But I think they're taking the best of their engineering and really adding in a lot of other cool stuff. Now, that being said, once again, foreshadowing remote ID. Did you see it in here? Did you see it? No, I did not see it in here. Um, It does... You did the R- R2K integrated. Sky uh, yeah, LTE. It's ready for remote ID. I bet you it is. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What's interesting as well is that they partnered this time with the Swiss company Oterian, and that's a company that makes software for enterprise drone solutions. So they teamed up with them, I'm not, probably for the control part of the drone, I would imagine. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this drone is going to fly. So the only, it seems like, non-Chinese flight controller that's affordable, at least, is made by Oterian. And it's, uh, it's my understanding that they're in South Korea, but the PX4 is the, it's the engine of Skynode. It's the engine of the Solo drone. It's the engine of the Skydio drone. It's the engine of the Alta drone. It's the engine of the H520 by Unique. And I think the reason why, I mean, we have seen so many drones on the same exact flight controller, and many of them have really not been successful. And I think that's because ease, convenience, features, smart batteries, 
and the whatnot, right? It really comes down to how the pilot is in control. And I will just say, after the story that we did regarding Skydio, and also seeing some news that I think we're going to put out next week regarding Skydio, this is exciting. What Freefly is really doing, I mean, they are really answering not just hey, we want this, hey, we want that, hey, we want that. They're like, here is everything that you need to go out and get the job done. Obviously, this is hype. Obviously, we don't know in the practical world if it will really work or how so. I'm just going to say this right now. We are really excited because we're hoping to do more uh, with FreeFly, and uh, we are really excited to be able to provide a practical kind of hands-on aspect of this aircraft. But I think that you can tell just for the, the length of time that I've spent on this aircraft, Taya, pretty excited. Oh, yeah, super excited. I mean, I can imagine if you're used to flying Inspire drones or you're in the market for an Inspire 2 with some professional camera equipment attached to it, then you might want to wait and see what FreeFly is going to come out with and what their price point is going to be. And also going back to uh, ease of use and ease of flying the drone. I mean, if you're flying with a camera package, at, uh, let's say between three to five thousand bucks and a drone that's probably going to be around ten thousand, then having confidence in, in being able to fly that drone and bring it back home safely is a huge factor. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, Haya. You nailed it. Well, that brings us to our next story. And as you know, Haya, we're not playing drone police anymore. And I that means me. That means, uh, you know, as the leader of my company, I ultimately take responsibility for everyone else, which means there are no more drone police here at DroneU, luckily. That being said, this brings us to our next story. And this next story, Haya... I'm not sure whether to uh, tee up this story as mesmerizing video or questionable legalities. I honestly, I'm not sure anyone really cares anymore at this point, but maybe the headline of this video should be, does this mesmerizing video showcase the true safety of drones flying in one of the most congested areas in the entire United States? Haya, what type of video are we talking about here? Yeah, this is a video that was posted on Facebook where you first found it, but then we also found out it was actually posted on YouTube. So whoever was flying this drone probably doesn't seem to care as much as to uh, this being found out by more people and a larger public. But apart from that whole uh, side of the story, I mean, basically what happens in this video is there's a guy flying an FPV drone, flying it straight up Empire State Building in Midtown New York and then coming straight back down. And it's an awesome video. The footage is somewhat scrambled because what you see is basically what the pilot was seeing. So it's an analog footage, if you will. And I think looking at the video that he must have flown up and down a building a number of times because sometimes he flies down straight, sometimes he spins down, which makes the entire Midtown section of Manhattan kind of swirl around you. Uh, it's a very cool effect, but it seems like he has been flying there for some time, let's say the length of at least one battery, I would imagine. Talking a little bit about the legalities of flying in New York, I mean, one problem that you're going to run into flying drones in New York City is that you're not allowed to take off and land in New York City with any type of aircraft. Doesn't matter if that was going to be a Zeppelin, a hot air balloon, an airplane, or a helicopter, or a drone. You need to adhere to only the locations where you're allowed to do so. When it comes to flying drones, there are only five places in New York City where you're officially allowed to fly them, and they're not in Midtown Manhattan. None of them is. The interesting thing is that during the whole COVID situation, New York has been way more deserted than ever. It, the, the streets are much, much emptier. Uh, less people are out and about. And what we have seen is that many more drone videos have shown up showing basically the skyline of the city or flying around the Freedom Tower or flying up and down the Empire State Building. And the funny thing is that really in none of these cases, anything has happened ever. I mean, I haven't really heard about any stories where people got ticketed or fined. We had this one guy early on in COVID who flew on the east side of Manhattan with a, uh, what was it, the DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise with the speakers pretending to announce some kind of message about people not getting together on a sports field. I don't think anything happened with that one either. The only time that we really see anybody get in trouble, well, there's two times. One was um, the Phantom 4 colliding with the Black Hawk helicopter over Staten Island a few years ago. I mean, that was too big a situation to ignore. More recently, we have seen George Steinmetz, whose uh, Mavic 2 Pro got confiscated by the NYPD because he was recording footage of mass graves and burials taking place in Hart Island. 
Island, which is an island on the east side of the Bronx. That's something that I guess the city did not want to have come out. So that's where they actually took action. I don't think it had to do so much to do with flying drones. It had more to do with the fact that he was showcasing what was actually going down in New York City. All the other cases where people are just flying drones in around New York City, we haven't really seen any action against them. And as a result, more and more videos have popped up. And I think this one is, uh, is one of the most recent ones and also one of the most daring ones, I think. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. We actually did a story. Um, we traveled out to the NTSB Training Academy to, uh, I think this was like three years ago, to get the lowdown on the drone that hit the Black Hawk helicopter in New York City. And I'm not, I, I don't think that any federal enforcement came down on him. I think he got like the equivalent of a parking ticket or a jaywalking ticket yeah. from the state or city. I can't remember who it was. Now, in regards to the other individual that you mentioned, he got his drone back, but it looks like the state kind of won with that one because they essentially temporarily inhibited him from maybe getting some of that media out. But if I remember, he cashed his feed and he showed us those photos of the mass burials. And so once again, you know, it's a first amendment right for journalism. And I just think that it's so imperative, ladies and gentlemen, to know your rights and to have backups, you know, cash your feed, etc. Now that being said, hi, going back to this enforcement, are you saying that you're seeing a trend of more and more people just outright kind of ignoring the rules? Oh, yeah. I would say, I mean, specifically about New York City, I mean, I can't speak for, for anything and everywhere, but what I have seen uh, on YouTube and social media is that more videos, drone videos of Manhattan have been popping up in the last year. Now, this is not scientific. I haven't been counting them. There's no comparison just based on what I've seen. I do see quite a bit of drone news, though, and I've seen more videos of the city. Some of them were even published by news outlets like Bloomberg. So I guess they didn't have any issue with this either. And also videos that are shot at night when it's dark flying over New York City. So if you look into the legalities of those flights, there's a lot of questions that will come up, I guess, in reality. I mean, nothing has happened in terms of uh, any accidents or incidents, luckily. But also, I don't think the NYPD or the FAA really care all that much at this point. Well, I mean, he buzzed a, uh, a, a cruiser at the very end of the video. Did you notice that? I was wondering. I mean, it's, uh, I, I tried to freeze that screen. It's hard to see what kind of car it is, but it does look like a police car for sure. It comes at him right at the end of the video really fast. And if that is a police car, then yeah, that will be, uh, <laughs> that will be a nice ending of that video, I guess. <laughs> it looks like a Ford Explorer NYPD car or SUV, whatever. Um, so, I mean, it, I, I think it looks like it. I mean, you guys are, hey, look, we do the news show to give you the information. You make the decision. What do you think about the, the flight? So let us know. We would love to hear from you. Again, maybe this just showcases just how safe drones are. Again, when we read the reports of the statistics that were provided by DJI, that I think it was only 35% of pilots actually reported or use the DJI Academy with the app to showcase how much that they have flown. And I think that they calculated an estimate of something like 27 million flights just in like 2019 or 2018 alone, I can't remember. And that being said, mm -hmm. when you think about how many flights there are, and you just think about the noise from the FAA about how unsafe we are and how this is such a problem, I think the proof is in the pudding. Drones are not a problem. But I think the FAA's newest problem is definitely arising right as they are hitting the climax of their issues with Boeing, which is, well, it seems like from jetpacks to David Blaine's you know, f uh, flying on balloons in a zero grid, it seems like the FAA is going to have a little bit more to actually worry about. And it might be a problem that's, uh, that might actually showcase that it's a real problem. Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, you're talking about what happened in L.A. I mean, they, they have bigger fish to fry. And I think also, I mean, you and I spoke recently about navigable airspace. And I think in terms of flying a drone around the Empire State Building, there's probably very limited risk to other manned aviation and nobody would be flying that close to that building anyway. The biggest risk is probably the drone coming down and crashing. Now, during COVID, those streets are, they're not empty, but they're they're almost empty. So 
I guess the risk in that sense was still quite limited in this case. Uh, in the video, you see him when he brings the drone back down, that there's hardly anybody walking there. So in reality, the risks are probably very minimal, which probably also explains why nobody's really going after uh, stories like these. Yeah, you bring up a really good point about navigable airspace. I have got to write that article and finish it up because this could actually be quite the argument in the favor of drone pilots. And I was given, I was leaked a document that was just, oh, oh, it's power. So I can't wait to uh, get that out and kind of go over the thought process of what airspace looks like in the eyes of regulators and the source material that they use to make decisions. Yeah. I finally got a hold of that. So I think it's going to be great to really talk about, legally speaking, right, what is navigable airspace? What does it really mean for Cinewhoop, for micro drones, for FPV? And we say this because, you know, the FAA before part 107 were like, you can't fly drones without our permission. You can't do this. You can't do that. And then it finally came down legally that drones were not aircraft and then they were defined as aircraft. And then we had part 107, et cetera, et cetera. So the FAA really has a history of playing defense and safety and it's us, 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 right? And I understand that, right? They're the administrative body. They're trying to control all the pilots and not have some wild goose chase go on or something absolutely crazy go on. Albeit, it seems like the industry could use a little bit of give and take. You know, it is a democracy. And when we take time to write 53,000 comments on remote ID and then none of them are listened to and the proposals are moving forward, then it really yeah. makes you wonder, OK, FAA, you no longer can say what you're saying. We can look at your actions and the history and make our own determinations based off of trends. And I think that this actually is a trend that's showcasing that drones are really safe and maybe the navigable airspace should be looked at in a different lens. And that's all I'm saying, Aya. I totally agree with you. And I think the FAA is uh, is under pressure from different uh, parts of the government. Uh, it's being pulled in different directions. And then when they talk about drones, they talk about drones as if we're one generic group of aircraft. And we're really not. I mean, if you look at FPV drones, most of the people that fly FPV, they either fly indoors or they fly around trees, around buildings, through parking garages. Like they, they fly in airspace that's 99% of the time is not navigable. I mean, no other airplane or or aircraft or helicopter will be using that space anyway. So that's like a whole different part of the discussion. Then talking about uh, where the FAA is going and talking about things like the regulation and remote ID, that doesn't seem to be geared towards helping hobbyists, recreational and small commercial pilots. I mean, that seems to be driven. They say officially that the pressure comes from Homeland Security and Department of Defense and those parts of the government. However, in reality, it seems that it's very much driven by uh, corporations such as Google, such as UPS, such as Amazon, who recently got approved as an air carrier. And it makes you wonder because in one of the, the articles that we'll be talking about uh, in this new show as well, the FAA is clearly moving forward with uh, finalizing remote ID for drones. And they said that was going to be effective in, in a few years. Now they say, or they have been saying over the last couple of months, that the, the rules are going to be finalized by the end of this year. And it really makes you wonder what's driving the FAA. And it seems that it's not just the Department of Defense and Homeland Security. It seems that it's where the money is coming from, which always uh, tends to be the big corporations and not you and me flying drones for a living or for fun or what have you. So there, there's a lot of stuff going on. And um, yeah, I don't know if it's if it's all heading in the right direction for the regular drone pilots like like you and me. I will just say hi. I'm encouraged right now for what's going on for regular drone pilots because you have other government agencies putting out PR releases and news. Maybe it wasn't directly from the agency, but things like DOI and fires, for example, mm -hmm. outright calling out. You know, right. the current regulatory environment saying uh, people are dying, people are losing their homes because you guys are sipping your coffee too long. So um, I think that honestly, the FAA lost its core credibility with the whole Boeing issue and allowing Boeing to say, we're going to set the standards for maintenance and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, right? Doesn't this showcase a lack of practical knowledge if we're still having Boeing planes falling out of the sky with hundreds of people on board? It makes you wonder, maybe the process does need another check 
right? Maybe it does need a little bit more accountability and less I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine because at the end of the day, everyone loses if no one's scratching anyone's backs. So it's, <laughs> I think it's important, you know, when you have core credibility being questioned even at the administrative level, when you have credibility being questioned by other agencies, when it's clear as glass that your patterns and decisions are to support these corporations for things like universal traffic management and pushing everyone else aside just to fit that group of people, unfortunately, while the commercial group of drone pilots may be a little bit more rational and willing to tote the line, there are about 20 or 30 million other FPV pilots who are not. And they give me a lot of hope for pushing back against the FAA to say, look, yeah. I mean, did we not just see, what was it, earlier this month that the federal government came out and said, yes, it was illegal for NSA to collect phone data. Okay, FAA, before you get sued, before you get your pants sued off, let's, uh, let's just make a smart decision and say, if we are collecting data on phones, federal government just said, you can't do that. How does remote ID comply? And once again, Haya, I think that there is a very reasonable means of remote ID as far as broadcast only as the standard. Maybe you check into an app like Lance and say, hey, I'm flying within a half mile here. It seems like that would actually suffice for what the FAA is looking for. But Haya, I mean, the deck is getting stacked in the drone service providers the hobbyists, the recreational, whatever nomenclature you want to call them, the people who built this industry are getting fired up. And it, we are getting help by the people that matter. And yeah. I think that you might actually see a real reaction to remote ID if they really drop it in December. It's going to be chaos. If they drop it in December the way it's been proposed and it has every indication that that's exactly what's going to happen, it will also mean that the FDA pretty much ignored the 53,000 comments. That's, uh, and I've, I've read a whole bunch of that. People spent a lot of time putting together, a lot of thought. And, and a lot of these comments, I mean, some of them are like, all right, uh, forget the FDA, blah, blah, blah. Those are not the most important comments. But some of them are thoughtful. They come from professional people that spent a lot of time that have a lot of experience flying drones. And they've put information in there saying, okay, this is why the proposed rule is not going to work. And this is how it should be amended to make it more effective. And you wonder, you wonder how much they're going to listen to that. And I think the, the parallel that you've drawn between um, the drones and then let's say airplane companies such as Boeing and then how the FEA deals with them is an interesting one because Boeing and other airline companies have pretty much been allowed to self-regulate them. And if you look at who the current administrator is for the FEA, it's Steve Dixon who recently uh, took charge there. He comes from Delta Airlines. So it seems like how the FAA is run would be to, for instance, take Brendan Schulman from DJI and make him the head of the FAA and let the drone industry self-regulate themselves. And I'm not saying that that's the way to go, but what I am saying is that that's a very, very different scenario than the one that we're currently dealing with, where we all feel that the FAA is not listening to us. I don't think there's ever been a case where 53,000 comments were submitted, where people actually went to the offices of the FAA in Washington to protest, and the FAA decided to let their employees not come to the office because they were worried about this situation. Somewhere there's got to be some middle ground where the FEA listens to us and incorporates our advice from people who actually fly drones for a living and come up with rules that are actually um, workable and don't um, create a situation where people are just not going to comply. I think you said it really well, Haya. I think you said it really, really well. And I think that at some point, if the FAA does not look at practical operations, then they are never going to know how to actually keep the airspace safe. And uh, again, I had a, a false TFR just last week, once again, that put me in an auto landing, and uh, it was a drone I forgot to hack. And again, and I, I literally took a screenshot and I said, think of this as remote ID. If you can't get a solid data connection, are you gonna be grounded and your flight controller is now just gonna be landing over a group of people? Like, this just doesn't seem intelligent whatsoever. In addition, you mentioned how corporate America is in this cycle of taking over government agencies to control them for the benefit of self-regulation. Once again, the proof is in the pudding, Haya. What is one of the 101 
uh, part 107 questions on the test regarding drones, right? Who do you go to get information regarding your maintenance schedule? Well, it's from the manufacturer guidelines. And I don't know about you, Haya, and while I love DJI drones, you can tell they definitely did not apply the engineering team to their Changlish in the uh, manuals for their drones. So when it says check the props every 10 hours and you know check the screws every 100 hours, that's not really gonna help you when you've got a little bit of dust on your obstacle avoidance sensors. It's a bright sunny day with an inexperienced pilot and now he just ran into a building because he doesn't understand the limitations of the aircraft. Haya, I just have to say, like this is all coming to a really serious head. And uh, this train is, is on a crash course. And I think actually that may be something that is needed to say, look, FAA, it is time to start listening. I mean, you know, human nature, laws of human nature say that we only react to change in the times of crises, right? So when things get really bad, that's when we're like, oh, well, we better change it, right? Well, you, you know, you lie in the bed you make, and I'm learning that the hard way too. So <laughs> sometimes it's just easier to make lots of hard decisions that are small, because if you constantly push them off, well then one day it might just add up. And I don't want that for anyone, friend or foe, frankly, so. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think uh, the 53,000 comments is a clear warning sign that people are not happy with how things are evolving. And if that rule comes out the way they've proposed it with all the concerns and, and yeah, issues that we have with it, I think they're going to have a tough time enforcing that rule. I don't think people are going to comply. But. Well, the survey, which again, we've got to talk about that survey because I didn't realize that our sample size of respondents was greater than the average survey in the industry by a factor of three. And so when you look at what is navigable airspace, when you ask the question, what do you think compliance is going to be? So it's an outward reference, not are you going to comply? What do you think compliance will be with others, right? Because if you ask the question, are you going to comply? Well, human nature is going to say, is this data being recorded? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so the answers may they not be as... Heads, but they shake their head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But when you ask people, well, do you think other people are going to comply? 80, I think it was 86% of people, and um, somewhere around 80% said they, they think compliance will be less than 25% of all pilots. Yeah. Oh, that, that wouldn't surprise me one bit. I mean, just the fact that uh, all the existing drones are non-compatible with remote ID and that therefore you're uh, only allowed to fly in certain locations and you can only go up 400 feet and any other direction 400 feet. I mean, why the hell would I want to fly a drone if those are the restrictions I have to fly within? And yes, I still have my DJI Mavic Pro and I'm still planning to fly that drone too. So the drones that people have nowadays are not going to be gone, let's say two years from now. People are gonna to wanna to fly those uh, those aircrafts. 100% Haya, and I would say that the old Luddite ways of resisting change have only exacerbated change. Let's look at Airbnb, right? The government was like, no, 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 you're a hotel. And we're like, no, this is a new way of doing things. GFY, yep. okay, what happened? The government pushed, push, 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 and we really got to see how rent seeking a lot of these politics are. And we got to really see that the old geriatric ways of, un of being unwilling to change, and that's what I mean by geriatric, unwilling to change, unwilling to live up to the rules and uh, you know life rules that you put out to your kids. If we are unwilling to change, then I think it's only going to energize the youth only going to energize the younger people to push harder and to exacerbate it. I mean, that's what history has shown. So it's going to be a really interesting show here, Haya. And I am so excited for this. I bought a freaking popcorn maker. It's right over there. <laughs> awesome. No, and, and I think this is also where um, the challenge is, right? I mean, you have the safety regulations and requirements and the focus on safety coming from the FDA based on what, more than 100 years of, of flying airplanes and helicopters, which makes a lot of sense. But then at the same time, you have this young and upcoming industry, the drone industry, which by the numbers is the safest form of aviation, but also the fastest growing. We fastly outnumber them in, in terms of aircraft, in terms of uh, operators. And then on top of it, we're coming up with all these new ways of flying. 
flying. We have FPV style drones. We have uh, pretty much uh, autonomous flying drones. We have new use cases. I mean, one of the next stories we can talk about is how farmers use drones to identify livestock. So they use RFID and they pair that up with their drone. They fly over their livestock and they're able to identify individual animals. I mean, the ways in which people are uh, using drones and, and the purposes that they find, it's, it's all over the place. They're coming up with new ideas every day. And I think the FDA, being a government body, is, is not set up to adequately deal with that and to kind of stay ahead of the industry in terms of coming up with uh, regulation that f- facilitates industry growth. Right now, I think the regulations... Um, are probably the main hurdle and the thing that's holding back the drone industry. And you hear that from big companies like Amazon, but you also hear it from people that well, you, you deal with a lot of them, people that need to get waivers to fly beyond visual line of sight or to fly at night or to fly over crowds. It's not easy. So a lot of these use cases are either not allowed or what people do is they break the rules and they fly their drone up and down the Empire State Building, as we've seen this week. So I think the FBA, we spoke about it in previous shows where uh, it might make sense for the FEA to come up with an unmanned version of the FEA dealing just with drones. And I still think that uh, people might think it's a far-fetched idea, but uh, it might actually be the best way forward, I think. I think so, too, because you cannot apply an old way of thinking to a new technology. While the old systems and risk-based performance, yes, I get that, but that also implies that risk-based performance has a system right? A system of judgment, a system of allowing things to happen. We've seen that with these complex waivers, there really isn't a system. The FAA is kind of like, well, research that, try that, tell us what happens, and then we'll go from there. It's like, um, guys, you know, it's time to uh, stop worrying so much about climbing the ladder and start putting some real brain power into, you know, the practical use cases, into practical safety and understanding that. And until they actually take the time to understand what it looks like to actually be a drone pilot, what it feels like, the issues that come up and the issues that arise from the real world environment, you know, things are only going to get worse before they get better. And so that being said, what I'm also trying to say is that might actually be good for the drone industry. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? I mean, part 107 came out, what, uh, 2016? So now it's 2020, we're four years down the road, we're talking about uh, remote ID being implemented, and I think the the official or original timetable for remote ID would be to become effective, what, 2023 or 2024? And I think the fact that the FEA is pushing remote ID so hard at this point and, and trying to come out with the final version of those rules by the end of this year kind of shows that they also understand that they can take years to come up with solutions. This industry is moving way too fast. The benefits are way too obvious to society. There are way too many people whose lives are being saved with drones. And at the same time, we have plenty of police forces, uh, first responders, search and rescue crews who still don't use drones. So the potential is far greater than what we're currently seeing. And I think even the FEA realizes that they, they need to figure out a better way to move faster and to come up with regulation that is more enabling rather than restrictive. But we'll still have to see how remote ID is going to pan out. So uh, fingers crossed, don't hold your breath, I guess. Isn't it interesting to see people make decisions out of fear? I mean, look at the FAA use DJI to be like, remote ID is great. Remote ID is great. And DJI actually came up with a solution that doesn't share your data. And again, we have to look at, you know, who was really pushing this? It was Brennan Schulman, who's an American. And I think it's really important to discuss, Haya. And I know you've got to run, so we will wrap this up. But this was a really good discussion because we have to look at history as our guide. And, you know, they, FAA used DJI to promote RID and then swept them under the bus, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chinese. Yeah, so, okay, so drone pilots, you now know what it looks like if you play ball with them and you try to help them create good rules that are actually made uh, to create safer airspace. Hi, I think the issue is, is that before it was like, well, we can trust these drones. It's probably not that big of a deal. And now it's political ideology that, hey, we may not be able to trust these things. So we better restrict this because we don't know what we don't know. Either that or we're incapable of communicating through complexities. But either way, Haya, let's see what happens. It's gonna be a good time. It's gonna be an interesting time. I mean, uh, 
yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening. It's cool to see new products coming out. I'm super excited for that new FreeFly Astro drone. I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit expensive, unfortunately, but it's cool to see an American company be super innovative and coming out with a drone that's going to give uh, drones like the Inspire 2 a run for their money, I think. Totally, totally. And I also, I love that you're recapping this because that FPV pilot flying the Empire State Building. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah. Cool flight should be allowed or no, no, no. Let us know what you think. Anyway, that's going to do it for us today. Hiya, thank you again for joining me as always. And guys, ladies and gentlemen, please don't forget to leave us a review, share the show, or drop a line and let us know what you think. That's going to do it for us today. He's the Flying Dutchman, and you can call me Taking Flight, because this is Ask Drone You. Drone You.